the black man in America was brought here in 1555 on the slave ship Jesus and other slave ships in chains. Not on pilgrim ships like the Mayflower or others, but slave ships. The black man was the property of the white man of America to work in the fields, to work in the houses, or to be traded, exchanged, or sold. Thus, separations occurred. Father from family, mother from daughters and sons, members of the family exchanged from other members of the family, beatings, killings, torture. Life for the black man in America was slavery, suffering, and death. The Emancipation Proclamation after the Civil War brought about the black man becoming a willing servant or slave for his former slave master. Not a return to his name, language, country, or God. The black man of America truly fitted the description of the people described in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and they shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. After the Civil War, the black man began calling himself in the names of his slave master, practicing the religion of the slave master, speaking the language of the slave master. He was given nothing by the slave master to go for self. Slavery, Suffering and death was now a lifestyle for the black man of America, now called Negro, Nigger, Coon, Piccaninny, Shine, Boy, Uncle. There was work from sun up to sun up. No pay or very little pay. More suffering, more misery, and more death. Those in the Ku Klux Klan and those out of the Ku Klux Klan kill the black man for nothing other than for the color of being black. Torturing and killing the black was a pleasurable thing, a sport for the white man. The black man called out for relief. The black man prayed to the mystery God for relief from his pain, misery, suffering and death. But no help came. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People was organized in the early 1900s by a group of whites and blacks. But still, no relief for the black man. The black man took up arms to fight for America in World War I, as he did in the Spanish-American War, the Civil War, but still no relief for the black man. More lynchings, burnings, more work, and no pay. Killing still, no relief for the black man. In the 20s, Marcus Garvey organized the Universal Negro Improvement Association, which attempted to instill black pride and to return blacks to Africa. Garvey was jailed and deported. No relief for the black man. Now the black man hated himself. He hated his color. He hated being black or even being called black. He joked, if you're white, you're right. If you're yellow, you're mellow. And if you're brown, stick around. But if you're black, get back. The black man of America experienced slavery suffering and death. He was calling himself sepia, olive-colored, creole, Indian, tan, bronze, chocolate. He had no money. He had no clothing or even a home. The Great Depression of 1929 arrived. Blacks lived mainly in the South, doing sharecropping, land renting, or even in bondage slavery. Some even migrated to the North to seek improvement as janitors, porters, maids, cooks, mammies, mail carriers, street cleaners, and to face even more slavery, suffering, and death as their brothers in the South. No relief to their cries or prayers for justice until about 1930, when a man, a savior, Master W.D. Farad began teaching and searching among blacks in Detroit, Michigan, for a man of the black condition and experience to lead and teach the black men of America and put him on the road to freedom, justice, and equality. For it was written of and foretold by God in Deuteronomy 18 and 18. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Greetings to you. 
I am Elijah Muhammad, the preacher of freedom, justice, and equality to my people here in the wilderness of North America. As it was prophesied, it now was fulfilled and true in Malachi 4 and 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet just before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children's hearts to their fathers, lest I smite the earth with a curse. This is a true story. It is not a drama. It is not a fairy tale. No, it is not a comedy, but a story of truth, a story of success. A story of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah. His mission of truth, his mission of success. Our leader and teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, was born the second week of October in 1897 to William and Marie, who went in the name of their former slave master, Poole, in an area near Sandersville, Georgia, and Deep Step, Georgia about five miles into the woods in a community known as Bold Springs, Georgia, which is the 100th militia district of Washington County, Georgia. His father was a preacher and taught sometimes in this church. He sharecropped to earn for his family as a farmer. The parents loved their children, eight sons and five daughters. But one son, Elijah, even as a child was unusual and different. He had a yearn for learning. He studied ways of nature, he would study the Bible and practice on his brothers and sisters as a preacher. He was destined for the future. In the back of the church is a family cemetery. The family of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad moved to Cordill, Georgia, about the time our leader was about six years old. There, our leader worked in the field along with his brothers and sisters, planting, plowing behind a mule, reaping and harvesting, picking and chopping crops. Schooling was not a required thing for Elijah and the other blacks in the South. Only work, day and night, night and day. The family of our leader and teacher moved from Sandersville, Georgia in the early 1900s to Cordell, Georgia, in an area known as Winona, about five miles south of Cordell. The Messenger's family was very, very poor. They lived across the road from the train depot, where one train a day passed through, which they called the shoe fly. The messenger's father was a sharecropper. This is Zion Hope Baptist Church, located on Old Highway 41, below Winona, where the messenger and his family attended. This is the road the messenger would walk down to see Sister Clara. It was called the Rock House Road. This is the road the messenger would walk down when he was going to visit his brothers Sam and Willie Holmes. Also, he moved in with his brother Sam. This was the old 41 highway. He will walk through Perry Hill and by Chris County chain gang camp. Rufus, the son of the messenger's brother, Sam Poole, stands on the spot on highway 41 below Winona, where the messenger lived with his brother, Sam, after marrying Sister Clara. Sister Clara's father did not know their whereabouts for one month. Rufus remembers this spot because of the old mulberry tree that he has his hands on. He also remembers the messengers rocking him to sleep all the time. This is near the Bed Good Cemetery. This is Winona, Georgia, some four to five miles below Cordell. Shown are the train depot and the railroad tracks. The place where the messenger lived is approximately 75 yards away. This is the slave master Thompson's home in Winona, Georgia, who owned the shack and land the messenger lived and worked on. The house is located next to the railroad tracks. This is the field where the messenger and his family plowed as sharecroppers in Winona, Georgia. This is the little crib that sits next to where the messenger lived. It was used for storing corn and other crops. This is the only house that we could find still standing where the messenger lived. This is where the family other messenger lived, and the messenger plowed the fields around it. It was here about 1915 at a church meeting house in the country 
where the messenger met Sister Clara, one of three daughters and two sons of the Evans family. Sister Clara was born in Houston County, just outside of Unadilla, on Jerry Clemens Place. Her father always rented land because he didn't like being pushed around. Sister Clara's sister, Rose, remembers the messenger always coming to their home on a Sunday afternoon, just after church, around 6 o'clock, and always leaving at 9 o'clock because he had to work in the fields the next day. He always visited wearing a blue suit and tie, but never a hat. But he did wear a straw hat and overalls as he plowed behind the mule under the hot sun. After two years of courtship, they were married, the second day of May, 1917. Sister Clara's father was furious because of their elopement. They lived in a rented room. Their son, Emmanuel, was born February 3rd, 1921, in Sister Muhammad's parents' home. As the messenger had left going to Macon, Georgia, seeking better employment and higher wages to support his family. The messenger sent for his wife and their one-and-a-half-month-old son, Emmanuel, to join him in Macon, Georgia, where he worked for the Cherokee Brick and Tile Company as a section hand and for the Southern Railroad and other jobs. In all of his jobs, his co-workers themselves chose him to be their spokesman or his employers chose him to supervise others. Blacks were poor and suffering with no jobs or jobs with very little pay. The beatings, torturing and lynching of blacks was a frequent and seemingly legal affair. Segregation was a way of life for blacks that was accepted by them. Some blacks tried to escape by changing their color by bleaching creams, using lye, chemicals, and hot combs to straighten their hair, or by even passing. Our leader, Elijah Muhammad, moved to Detroit. There he worked at the American Can Factory and Chevrolet and other places. Almost always being chosen by his fellow workers or employers as a leader of men to be foreman or supervisor. He was always kind, considerate, and concern for his fellow brothers. Blacks were still suffering all over America. The Poole family, as our leader did not yet have the knowledge of himself or his God, and was yet going in the slave master's name. They were living at 8474 Manhattan Street in Hamtramck, in an area surrounded by Detroit, Michigan, with an outside toilet. In Detroit, one day in the latter part of 1931, our leader met with Master W.D. Farad, a savior who was teaching among blacks at 3208 West Hastings. Our leader immediately recognized the power of the message and the man teaching it. Our leader right away accepted the truth of the message and the giver of the message, seeking more insight, more wisdom, more knowledge, and more understanding. Our leader's family was poor and suffering the children, Emmanuel, now 10, Ethel and Nathaniel and Lottie, had little or no clothing, mostly wearing clothes given to Sister Muhammad by the people she worked for. Emmanuel, remembering, said, they did not know the original color of the clothes as they had so many patches. Their shoes were reinforced with cardboard, and their father could not afford shoe repair or even purchases. No toys for the children, only an old tricycle which their grandfather found and gave to Emmanuel. Ethel had an old rag doll, and Emmanuel would wear his mother's shoes to school, only to take them off at the railroad crossing to hide them before continuing on to school barefooted. Meat was on the table about twice a month. Elijah was too poor to even buy the poison meat, the pig or the pork. Their meat purchases were chicken feet, clipping the toenails before cooking, sometimes buying and killing chickens, saving the feathers to make pillows and mattresses. Sour, spoiled bean soup was sprinkled with vinegar to kill the taste and odor for eating, but never thrown away. Emmanuel would pick thrown away vegetable leaves to feed the family, and picking coals along the railroad tracks to burn in the stove for cooking and heating. This was the condition then, and yet today, of the black man in America to which our leader and teacher sought relief and now had a solution. Immediately upon accepting the message of our savior, W.D. Farad, the condition of our leader and teacher, who was now called Elijah Kareem, began to be improved. He moved into a home at 3050 Yeeman Street in Detroit, which was owned by Mr. and Mrs. Butler. 
where Mr. W.D. Farrad paid the first month's rent. Later, he moved to 283 East Hancock Street in a two-family home where his brother Kalat and family lived on the first floor. The Temple of Islam was located at Shane and Chestnut Street, now a vacant lot, then 3408 West Hastings, and later at Adams and St. Antone. In 1931, Sister Muhammad wrote and told her mother that they had met a savior. But Sister Muhammad's mother did not want to believe her. But Sister Muhammad was very staunch in her belief. Always interested to reach the then 17 million of our black people in the wilderness of North America, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad started up a weekly newspaper called The Final Call to Islam to give the message of his mission a larger audience than he had at the temple meetings. On September 5th, 1934, Mr. Muhammad and his family took up residence in Chicago, Illinois at 5830 South Wabash Avenue. The house is still standing. Later, they moved to 3735 South Giles, which is still standing. In the late 30s, they moved to 5308 South Wabash. The structure is still standing. In the meantime, as the messenger was chased by enemies to be killed, his family and followers held fast to the handle of Islam. The men, known as the fruit of Islam, worked. Their wives and daughters stayed home and cooked and sewed, taking care of their homes, husbands, and babies. Sister Muhammad, the wife of the messenger, carried out instructions of her husband, assigning work duties to her children, requiring that they complete their work, keeping a close discipline, loving family as they suffered ridicule, for attending the Muslim school classes in homes, and for even being clean and self-respecting, and wearing long dresses, and covering their heads. Here are some of the first begotten of the dead of the lost found nation of Islam. Brother Muhammad, tell us your first impressions of the messenger when you first met him. I, when I first met the messenger, well, I knew it, that he was an unusual person. And, uh, and his teaching of Islam to us in the year of 1934, I accepted Islam. And uh, I, he gave me duties to perform, such as perform, a reformer, secretary, and that kind of work. And I, I had an insight of what was really being done. And I thought that uh, he was a wonderful teacher. Where were the teachings being held at that time? The teaching at my first time of hearing was at 33, 35 South State Street, the old Art Fellows Hall. Okay. All right. What was, how was the struggle during the time before and after the messenger came? At that particular time, times were very hard and uh, people were without food and clothing. And we had a pretty tough struggle at the onset of the teaching of Islam in, in, in 1934. And uh, we had our means of getting something to eat and food was by having push carts, as we call them, together, junk to carry to the junkyards and things of that sort. And uh, we. Uh, as I said, we had to put a tough struggle, but we took it out. My name is Sister Viola Kareem. I heard of the messenger in 1932. My husband and father was the first to visit the temple, the Art Fellow Hall at 33rd and State Street. They copied the 10 questions off the board, which is the student enrollment. The next meeting, I recited it and was given a letter to write in for my holy name. The first meeting was held at 33, uh, the 33rd and State Street, the Art Fellows Hall. And they met Wednesday night, Friday night, and Sundays. Wednesday night at 8 p.m. to 8 to 10, Sundays from 2 to 4. Brother Leslie, when did you first hear the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? 1934. How were times for you doing that? Time was rough, then. Did you get the... Were you working? No, sir. Not no regular. It's work. I guess why have I get work to do? Where did you first hear of the teaching? 33, 35 State Street. 
what type of, uh, how did you first hear of it? Well, uh, I was, uh, I lived at 3922 State Street, and it was a fellow I knew come to my home that morning. I was getting ready to go to the Grand Theater to move the picture show. He said, once you go to 335 State and hear the teacher, and I hear what? Who is it? What's he talking about? He says, it's for going here. He said, I never heard a man talk like that. I said, all right. He said, I went on. Hurry. What was your first impression of the messenger? Well, he told me what I wanted to know. And what was that? Well, I'll come in this shape and all right with that. These are the Muslim sisters of Chicago wearing the first uniforms designed by our leader and teacher for the Muslim girl training and general civilization class known as the MGT and GCC. They are some of the messenger's first followers who experienced the difficulties of the 30s, the hard times of the 40s, and who are yet with him today. On May 20th, 1933, on the back porch of 283 East Hancock Street in Detroit, Michigan, the Savior, who was preparing to depart, and the messenger embraced. Both were crying, with tears running down their cheeks. After coming to Chicago, Master Farad Muhammad would send for our leader, along with the laborers of Detroit, to meet with him at the Brookmount Hotel on 40th and Michigan Avenue. The site is now raised and vacant, but the message still lingers. They would also meet at the Grand Hotel on 50th and King Drive. Messenger Muhammad was busy studying, taking in every word of the master teacher, W.D. Farad, a savior to the black man of America. In turn, our leader vowed and pledged to impart this message to the black man of America without fear or concern for his own life, which he would soon come to know would be a direct challenge and a word he would keep to this very day. The black man of America was thoroughly brainwashed, hard-headed, stiff-necked, rebellious, proud, and a hater of himself, who loved the slave master and his children, who were still inflicting suffering and death and gave the black man nothing. Oh, I got plenty of nothing, and nothing plenty for me. In 1934, the messenger taught at the Odd Fellows Hall at 3335 South State Street, which is now a vacant lot. He later taught at the Pythian Temple at 3741 South State Street. The building is still standing. And because black people were afraid and fearful of the slave master, they would encourage the slave master to cancel or not to rent suitable places for our leader and teacher to teach. But Elijah Muhammad was dedicated and determined to deliver the message of freedom, justice, and equality to the black man. So he taught in the home of Mr. Marcellus Jordan at 18 East 30th Street, and the home of Clara Haziz, 3721 South Federal. Now a housing project is on this site. The home of Tamar Haziz at 2912 South Prairie is now an open area adjacent to a playground and across from a police station. And the home of Amos Muhammad, located in an alley over a garage in the 3300 block between Vernon and South Parkway, now known as King Drive. The alley is now a street leading to the entrance of the Lake Meadows housing complex. From the time our leader took on the mission given to him by Master W.D. Farrard, others the master taught became jealous and envious, and wanted the position of honor bestowed on his chosen Elijah. Truly like the proverbial crab, they sought to endanger our leader's life by threatening him, chasing him, and seeking to kill him. But our leader, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, was well prepared for his mission by his teacher, Master W.D. Farrard. He was satisfied Elijah was the one he had come looking for and found. Allah and he were close, close as the jugular vein. The Savior gave our leader a page which read, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me, in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our leader would have to recall this reminder often, 
as the enemies and hypocrites devised plans against him always, hourly, weekly, monthly, yearly, and to this present day. In 1934, one Detroit radio station broadcasted that, quote, the leaders of the cult, Muslim believers, have been arrested, end quote. More than 700 unarmed Muslim men, women, and teenage boys marched in an orderly lines to police headquarters at 1300 Bogan Street, where Messenger Muhammad was being held on charges of, quote, contributing to the delinquency of minors, end quote. Because Muslim children were being educated in the University of Islam and were no longer attending the white-run public schools, as the Muslims approached, police armed with billy clubs rushed out, pushing and shoving the Muslims with their clubs. Many police were even mounted on horseback. The sentiment of black people in Detroit was decidedly with the Muslims, as blacks, Muslims, and non-Muslims alike courageously turned the tide in favor of the Muslims. One police leader quoted, we can't handle this, we can't handle those niggers, end quote. That officer and many with him turned in their badges and their guns rather than join the fight against the Muslims. The Muslims who led the faithful in support of their leader, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, led the brave group marching back to the temple, armed only with a strong belief in the power of Allah, as taught by his messenger. Most of the Muslims were uninjured, while many policemen were known to have been hospitalized. Here are some of the unarmed Muslims of Muhammad Temple of Islam, number one, Detroit, Michigan, at the 1934 attack by police. Brother Muwala Haziz, Brother Rasul Ali, Brother Abdul Haziz, Brother Ernest Karim, Brother Carl Bacha, a junior fruit at the time, Brother Leon Haziz, also a junior fruit at the time, Brother Colander Muhammad, Brother Jasabel Joshua, Brother David Bacha, and these accepted Islam after our Savior left Detroit, Brother Governor X, Brother Emmett X. On March 5, 1935, in the courtroom of Judge Scheffler in the police headquarters, at 11th and State Streets in Chicago, 44 unarmed Muslims, 16 brothers and 28 sisters withstood a fierce onslaught by heavily armed police who fired shotguns, pistols and automatic weapons without one single Muslim casualty. Yet, a police captain was stricken with a heart attack and died at the scene, and a court bailiff was shot and wounded by one of his own police officers. Although the initial disorderly conduct charges against the Muslim family which had defended itself against the attack a month earlier on the State Street trolley car had been dropped in court, the fight was brought on when an angry bailiff literally ran through the courtroom and pushed the Muslim sister as she peacefully and quietly filed out of the courtroom. Surely this event served only to strengthen the belief of the Muslims in the divine protection of Allah as taught to them by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The enemy had been welled armed with weapons of great firepower the Muslims were armed with divine truth and the will to fight the enemy and the might of arms. The Muslims fought the battle in the name of Allah, Master W.D. Farad, to whom all praises are due forever, and in the name of Allah's last messenger, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Here are some of the unarmed Muslims recalling the armed attack by the police on that historic day, March 5th, 1935. Could you tell us about the bus incident that started the police incident. As far as my knowledge, Brother Wali Muhammad is our brother Zach Hassan. Children uh, were going through a little phase there that we clearly were known to be as a sort of hatred. They were at a time where you could not even walk in some areas without being molested or picked upon. His children were on the bus and this incident started with his children. What really happened on the bus were the dispute among the children. Brother Zach Hassan's children. And the older people such as the mother of the kid wanted to take up her child's part and chastise Brother Zach Hassan's son or daughter. But his wife intervened. She would not let it go. When did you first hear of the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? When did you accept? I thought it was 35. I think it was 35. Tell us about the 
fight at the police station. Tell at us all about that. At the fight at the police station? Well, we were supposed to go out one door, and we were going out the wrong door, they said. And when they were talking to us, our brothers wouldn't stand for it. They talked back out of there, you know. And from one to another, they were with the fight. Who, who made the first blow, or who hit the first blow? First, I know, the devil. And then, then what happened? Well, the devil went to shoot him. Was this in the courtroom? In the courtroom. And then what happened? Well, as far as I know, he was just shooting. If you get one boom over there, and look, boom over there, and look, and boom over there. And of course, I wasn't doing nothing but looking. But they was continuing to shoot. Continuing to shoot. I heard you teaching him. Wow, the mission in 1932. Would you give us some information on the police incident down at 11th Street Station in Chicago? Well, we was down there with a, one of the brothers in which I had a trial concerning this little boy. And, and uh, so the, the judge was having the trial, and they had seen it, they found out they was Muslim, and they'd taken them back is to consider the squash case. And when the brother came back, he came back all of a sudden, you know, and he says, that's all, it's all over with, brother. And everybody mounted the floor. And then, uh, that it seemed it upset them, the judge, see? And the judge says, sit down, sit them down, sit them down. And uh, we was tend to fix the ground, and so therefore, uh, that's why the fight began. Well, when I first heard the teaching of Ron Elijah Hunt, it was in 1933. And would you tell us about the police incident, the fight that occurred on the, at the 11th Street Station in, in Chicago? Well, as I can say, it was uh, the beginning of the fight. I wasn't in that group. But I was in the group where the, the fighting was with the brother and the police. Tell us what happened at the, during the fight. Well, it was much more, didn't nothing happen no more than just the, uh, the brothers was, and the police was fighting. And I guess each one of them was fighting to win. Were you arrested? Yeah, I was really arrested with all the rest of the groups that they, the, the, uh, the group. Yeah, it was there. How many were, of you were arrested? Well, I think it was uh, 23 of us and 17 brothers. Uh -huh. During the chase by the hypocrites, Messenger Muhammad met and was received by many people who heard him and who believed in him. <laughs> Minister Benjamin X of Muhammad's Temple No. 24 in Richmond, Virginia, rented a room to the Messenger of Allah for nearly seven years in Washington, D.C. During that time, Minister Benjamin recalls that the Messenger was a very special man even then. When he first met Messenger Muhammad in 1935, and though he had only lived in his home for nearly three days, the minister recalls that he had not seen the messenger eat nor go out for a meal. So he invited Messenger Muhammad to eat with him and his family on the next evening, and the messenger accepted. The next morning, the messenger went out, and even though he was the guest for dinner, he bought all the food that would be needed for the meal. That afternoon, he borrowed an apron and assisted Minister Benjamin's wife, Clara, as she prepared the meal. He then asked the minister to invite some friends, a practice that became a frequent one at the minister's home, and one which the messenger still carries on today. That evening, the guests, the minister, and his family first learned of the great teachings which the man they knew in their home as Mr. Bogans possessed. It was there in Washington, D.C., at 1306 Gerard Street, on May 8, 1942, the Friday before Easter, in the home of Mrs. Williams, where messenger Muhammad was arrested by two FBI men. This incident began a new chapter in the courageous struggle of the Muslims, as most of all the male followers were jailed in federal prisons with the messenger, including two of his own sons. Most of the activity for the next five years was carried on by the Muslim women, at that time led by the messenger's wife, Sister Clara Muhammad. Minister Benjamin recalled. Later on, uh, when this, uh, uh, the time, Sister Muhammad, his wife, Clara Muhammad, she got Mr. Steve Barnes and he was, Mr. Wasn't Zimmy. Mr. 
children in school and I was harassed about um, the outside school, you know, public school, bringing them in, but with no problems at all, I kept them in the Muslim school and uh, took care of them very well by working. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad was in Chicago when his son Wallace was born. Master W.D. Farad named him and wrote to Sister Muhammad to take special care of him. To our leader, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Master Farad Muhammad said, now you have one born to help you in your mission. During 1945 and 1946, the Detroit Temple was located at Temple and Rhea Pelly Street. The site is now a slaughterhouse. During that particular time, when the messenger was teaching us, he was away from us most of the time because we had an infiltration of hypocrites, the hypocritical type of person who wanted to take his life, who wanted to persecute him. And those were very, very perilous times. But of course, we with the faith banded together. And by banding together and keeping the faith and praying to Allah, we were able to overcome these. But of course, they cropped up in different forms. They came in, they partook of the teachings, and they wanted to proclaim that they were members, but actually they were not. We had various forms of deception. And as a consequence, as a direct consequence of this, we, the poor Muslims at that particular time, realized the peril that was around us. And we had to be very, very cautious, very careful, and very diplomatic the way that we handled the situation and handled the people that were around us. For seven years, the enemies and hypocrites chased the messenger as he fled from city to city to avoid the wrath of such a wicked people but yet always continuing his mission, going from Milwaukee to Washington, Cincinnati, Baltimore, New York, Boston, Springfield, Newark, Providence, Richmond, and Atlanta. He was always teaching salvation for the American so-called Negro. Brother uh, Jordan, yes. would you tell us about the times during the early 30s when Messenger Muhammad was running for his life, during the time when they had the enemy and the hypocrites were? Well, things were going along pretty fair, but they put it rough, and then they got after him, and they tried to close out because the children were going to school, and they didn't want them to send the children to school. And so they suffered around, and so all of a sudden, he had to leave out. And so at the time when he was leaving, he sent for me to come over to take his works on, carried on until he returned. And so at the time that uh, he was going away, they would come in and ask me, did I know why he was? And I'd tell him no. And I'd say, I'm looking for him myself. And, <laughs> and so that's the way it went. And so otherwise, time was hard. So we just got him from door to door, trying to keep the temple open and moving on until the things got kind of quiet. America declared war against Japan, Germany, and Italy on December 1941. Again, the black men of America were suffering and being put to death as he took up arms with the slave master and his children. Elijah Muhammad and his followers were Muslims who submit to the will of Allah. They lived, taught, and practiced the religion of Islam, which means peace. In the early 30s, what it means, the message was in Detroit. And uh, so when the message was in Detroit, and then he came to Chicago, what it means to set up uh, set up a temple here in, in Chicago. And he did set up a temple here in Chicago. And then after he got the temple set up in Chicago, he went back to Detroit. And in Detroit, what I mean, in the 
And then he had some disturbance, what I mean, with, with, our, with our enemy. And uh, this was in 33. And then the, the Captain Machar, he got a, about four or five carloads of us and, and rushed to Detroit. They got a telephone, telegram, what I mean, from Detroit that, that, uh, that they were involved in the mess. And they got five or six cars, what I mean, loaded us in, they called us from our home, to get to the temple at 30, 33rd and State, the old Oddfield Hall, while we had a temple at, quickly. So we got there as quick as we could. And we, and they got us together, we left there that evening. It must have been around about four, about four, four thirty or five o'clock for Detroit. So we went, we made it into Detroit. I don't know just what time, but we made it into Detroit and went to the messenger's house while he was the messenger was. He was gone. And we left there and we went to the jail. And we didn't go to the front door to go in jail. We went all the way, walked all the way from the bottom step all the way to the top. Stopped on every floor looking for the messenger. And so the, they told us what it meant when we found out he said he, he isn't here. And so we left. And we rode around, drove around through Detroit, what it meant for a long time. Then we left back to Chicago. We come back to Chicago and so I think when they had to fight down at 11th Street, this is when they uh, when our enemy, what I mean, really come and come to be, what I mean, against the messenger more than what he was. And the messenger, and he didn't, he moved to Chicago. In 1942, on direct orders of the president, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was arrested for draft evasion, even though he was 45 years old, far beyond the qualified years for drafting. Approximately 132 followers were sent to federal prison for not taking up arms. What a brutal and ironic turn for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Successfully enduring a chase of seven years by enemies who were seeking to kill him, and now to begin serving a prison sentence in the hands of his open enemy. He taught salvation, proper foods to buy, and proper preparation and clean living. The messenger was arrested May 8, 1942 in Washington, D.C., was bonded on $5,000 bail money, which was brought to Washington by his wife, Sister Clara Muhammad. The messenger returned to Chicago. On the 18th of September, as the messenger was teaching the theology of time, he told the Muslims to expect some unfortunate events to happen affecting them, but to hold fast to Islam. On September 20th, 1942, the FBI agents arrived at the temple before the meeting and arrested approximately 100 men of the fruit of Islam. The messenger was arrested at his home at 6026 South Vernon Avenue. Here was a peaceful man, sentenced and convicted along with his followers all over the country for not taking up arms. Serving in Milan, Michigan at the Federal Correction Prison along with his son Emmanuel and other of his followers, among them who were Brother Lester. Brother Lambert, tell us when did you first accept Islam? Uh, 1933. Uh, Brother Lambert, tell us about the arrest incident of the Muslims in 1942 at the temple. September 20, 1942, 104th, 51st Street. Uh, one Sunday morning, we went to a meeting, and uh, the FBI had, 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 I think, broken the door, and uh, and, every, and everyone came in to arrest them and put them in jail. And uh, we got sent about Jerry Brown. I was, we was Sent to Mile Mitchell, Michigan, and then January 25th, 1945, we were released. What were you arrested for? Uh, arrested for selective service. For not going to the army? Not going to the army. Life in the prison was with, with the messenger. The first four months in prison was fairly hard on us because the prison authorities didn't understand us. But after we were there for four months, then they began to understand us and began to relinquish some of their restrictions on us. We were able to move around in the prison freely without any hindrance. Now the food in the prison wasn't good because we being Muslim, we could not eat any kind of food. Most of the food that was uh, cooked there in prison was cooked with pork and this is forbidden to, eat, uh, to be eaten by a Muslim. So, uh, our life there in prison was good after we were there for about six months. Then the things began to get better for us there. Well, I was in uh, Milan, Michigan, the federal institution. I 
come to be one of the first trustees. And I uh, taking care of the warden's little grandson. The Holy Apostle had a special assignment from us, and that was in the officer quarters. So when I get off early, I would go by and help him get through early so he can come in and teach the brothers in the evening. And he taught me how to pray. While I was in there, I thought I knew when I first went. But after I got with him, helping him get through, he blessed me with teaching me a special prayer for him. I have a special prayer that he taught me, special for him alone. And therefore, our first time being there, when coming out, Officer Whitehead, before we getting ready to leave, he said to me, coming with the Holy Apostle, he said, uh, 9740, you're glad you're going home now, aren't you? I told him, no, sir, Mr. Whitehead, I'd rather for the Holy Apostle go and I stay here. The messenger Muhammad was sent to Milan, Michigan, to the federal institution there. Most of us brothers were sent up to Sandstone, Minnesota, a correctional institution in Sandstone, Minnesota. What was a typical day for the followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad during these times while you were in prison? Yes, well, after the period of quarantine was over, then we were assigned different jobs there in the institution. And uh, after these jobs were done, then we would go back to our prison dormitory and we would then set up classes. And uh, these classes would consist of the recitation of the various lessons that we were given, plus mathematics, English, uh, languages, and science and history. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad was a model prisoner, respected by inmates and guards alike. He was made an orderly, in charge of the guards' quarters and continued to teach salvation to his followers in the prison who were black in the Milan Federal Prison. From 1942 to 1946, our leader served in prison, returning to Chicago in 1946, immediately taking up active leadership among his family and followers from whom he had been absent during the chase by hypocrites and imprisonment by his enemies. The Muslims bought an old animal hospital at 824 East 43rd Street. They cleaned it up and repaired it and began holding school and temple meetings in it. On the upper part of the building, where you see the iron pieces, they put the name in neon, Muhammad's Holy Temple of Islam, and the Crescent. In July 1947, the messenger opened at 3117 South Wentworth, a grocery, bakery, and restaurant. The people were amazed. Here was a grocery store without pork, no black man had ever attempted to open a food establishment on such a high order. A clean place, no grease, or even a grease smell in your clothes after leaving. Pure ingredients, and the best in cooking and baking, and of course, fairly priced. Yet blacks were fearful and unpatronizing. His daughters, Ethel and Lottie, served as cooks and bakers, as their brothers pitched in as dishwashers, cleanup men, and delivery boys. Mr. Muhammad practiced what he preached, and his family loved, respected, obeyed, and followed his principles of being clean, hardworking, respectable, and fair. The Korean War breaks out. Again, the black man in America is called upon to give his life and blood for his former slave master with no regard for himself and his hellish condition of life in America. In 1952, the messenger bought an old 19-room house in the Hyde Park area of Chicago. In this area, blacks were being placed on old, large homes that were converted into rooming houses and apartments. Mr. Muhammad put his sons to work, cleaning the house up and clearing the grounds of debris and filth around it. He successfully turned a slum into a showpiece of clean living, shaming the remaining whites of the area who began to immediately to fix renovate and remodel their homes in an effort to rebuild and restore the community to a high quality standard as Mr. Muhammad had done to his home. During the 50s, the seeds that the messenger had planted in New York, Hartford, and wherever he went throughout the United States began to germinate. Young people were accepting the teachings and temples were being organized and common people were being made great orators from the strength and power of the truth and the message taught to them by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Among them were Malcolm X, 
a convict whose correspondence and learning from the messenger gave him such truths that his relaying of that message made him known by many, along with other ministers, such as Isaiah Kareem, Jeremiah Shabazz, Louis Farrakhan, Lucius Bia, Lani Shabazz, Theodore Hamza, and Abdul Karim. And he can do the same for any man or woman today if they would accept the truth of his teachings. In the latter half of the 50s, the messenger assigned his son, Wallace D. Muhammad, to become minister and put him in charge of the temple in Philadelphia. The son who the Savior said would help him in his mission was now beginning to teach. <laughs> On 20th, 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court declares and rules segregation as illegal on a suit advanced by the NAACP. The black man of America remains the only people of any government who must petition for rights while stating to be citizens and denied the rights by white citizens of America. Mr. Muhammad had long ago declared the black man must remember that rights are different than authority. And this authority, the white man was not granting to the black man to do for himself. Blacks continue to ignore and reject the life-giving and life-saving teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. They despise the name black, think it derogatory, and would fight those who would call them black by name, institution, innuendo, or implication. They offer and subject their babies to beatings and killings at Little Rock High School and to other schools, claiming it was necessary for them to sit and to go to school alongside whites in order to use their black brains as the white man used his. Mr. Muhammad did not weaken to the overwhelming ignorance of his black people, but rather cry and bemoan the fact that people rejected their true salvation. In December 1955, he and his followers purchased a Jewish synagogue and school at 5335 South Greenwood Avenue, where they continued to set an uplifting standard of education for the black man. He said, get an education which will benefit their own people and not education adding to the storehouse of their teacher. We need education, but an education which removes us from the shackles of slavery and servitude. Get an education, but not an education which leaves us in an inferior position and without a future. Get an education, not an education that leaves us looking for the slave master for a job. Mr. Muhammad's plans are on a grand scale. Here is a man who understands the nature of economics. He knows the black man must have possession of the land to provide in the broadest sense all natural resources as we find them in nature. These natural resources include not only the land part of the Earth's surface, but rivers and lakes, mineral resources, and natural vegetation. His sons, Herbert and Elijah Muhammad Jr., launched a program on Back to the Farm to stimulate interest among the followers to want to own land and getting away from the brainwashed trick of a slave master and desiring to be a janitor or an elevator operator rather than being a farmer or owner of land to produce his and others' needs. Remaining sad over the poor living conditions of our black people, Mr. Muhammad purchased a 12-unit family apartment building at 8201 South Vernon to move more of his followers who, like other black people, are denied suitable living quarters at a scale comparable to their wages because they were black. From 1955 through 1959, the Muslim's Detroit Temple No. 1 was located at 5401 John C. Lodge. The building since then has been demolished. At a time when the hatred and self-hatred of black was so great that even black newspapers such as the Pittsburgh Courier were only read behind closed doors. 
the addition of the column, Mr. Muhammad Speaks to the Pittsburgh Courier, brought an increase in the sale of the newspaper and soon made it a nationally read paper with a circulation exceeding 120,000 newspapers. This change in the readership of the Pittsburgh Courier was brought about by the sale and distribution of the paper by followers of Muhammad, whose first task in the sale of any copy was to convince blacks to accept and to be proud of being black. Although the Courier refused responsibility for the messenger's column, it enhanced the credibility of the newspaper, which was spread to other black newspapers, such as the New York Amsterdam News, the Philadelphia Tribune, the Chicago New Crusader, the Herald Dispatch, the Newark Herald News. The Herald Dispatch, then a local LA shopping guide, was a nationally circulated newspaper as a result of the followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad issued a magazine called The Muslim World and USA, and books called The Supreme Wisdom, Volumes 1 and 2, containing condensed sayings of his teachings. In 1956, Brother Johnson X. Hinton was selling jewelry on 125th Street in New York City when a domestic quarrel ensued. When the police arrived, they began beating the husband. Brother Johnson asked, why didn't they just arrest the man? Their answer was to call in a 1013, meaning police in trouble, and beat and arrested Brother Johnson, taking him to the 38th precinct with a hole in his head, where he collapsed into a coma. After learning of the incident, Muslims began marching on the precinct for the brother to be taken to the hospital for aid. At the insistence of Messenger Muhammad, Dr. Thomas Matthews, a renowned black neurosurgeon at Sydenham Hospital, operated on the brother, stating the miracle of his living was attributed to his strong belief in Allah and the teachings of the messenger. Attorney Edward W. Jocko, being retained at the insistence of the messenger on the brother's behalf, charged the city with false arrest and police brutality and was awarded $75,000. In 1958, Brother John Albert answered the door to the police who were looking for his brother-in-law, who was not there. Informing the police of the brother's absence, Brother John closed the door, at which time the police began shooting into the door indiscriminately, unconcerned of the occupants. After the shooting, the police went in to find that the women and children, along with Brother John Albert, were unharmed. They were arrested, all but the children. Being a temple night, the believers were alerted and came to the station, demanding the release. All were, with the exception of Brother John, released. The messenger again engaged the attorney, Edward W. Jocko, who successfully defended him, as the prosecution had placed over 110 false charges. After a four-week trial, in an effort to harass the Muslims, the jury came back with a verdict of not guilty. The message began to reach larger and larger audiences, the temples being unable to accommodate the larger numbers of people wanting to hear Mr. Muhammad. So he began speaking in larger halls and arenas. Most historic of all of these was his May 29, 1959 address at the Uline Arena in Washington, D.C., before a crowd of over 10,000 people. Never before had any black ever received honors that were reserved for visiting heads of state. At the airport, he and his entire party were met by the chief of police and received a police escort to their hotel, then to the arena where he spoke and again to the airport after the address. Just 17 years before, in this same city, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had been arrested and taken to jail. During the 50s, he also made major appearances in New York City. On October 1955, July 1958, and November 1959. Continuing to build on his program, Mr. Muhammad in the early 50s purchased a large building at 614 East 71st Street, containing six apartments and two stores, where he established Temple No. 2 Grocery and Restaurant. On the upper floors, he moved six families who were able to afford, but were denied suitable housing at their standard of earnings. In the rear of the building, he established a cleaning plant, where he put his sons Emmanuel and Nathaniel to work along with some of his followers as garment cleaners. At 71st and South Park, he opened a bakery offering pure whole wheat ingredients, cooked in vegetable oils, or butter at low, low prices. In 1955, he opened a modern clean barbershop at 718 East 79th Street. And in 1957, he moved the clothing store to larger quarters at 79th and Road Street. He opened a clothing garment factory at 451 East 79th Street, 
where his daughter Ethel worked at managing, designing and supervising workers as the messenger continues to create jobs. There were bigger and better grocery stores, restaurants, bakeries, and clothing stores in almost any white neighborhood. But in the black community all over America, this was a miracle. Here, instead of a black man begging, was a black man attempting to do for self and showing black people how to come into unity and do the same. Mr. Muhammad's idea was more than just a little store, a shop, or a factory. His was and is the vision of people doing operating a nation as other self-respecting and civilized people. In December 1959, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, accompanied by his sons, Herbert and Akbar, took the first trip outside of America. In his visit to some of the governments of Islam, Mr. Muhammad received the greatest respect, welcome, and honor of any so-called American Negro ever to visit that world from America. He was shown through their mills, their government facilities, their schools, their farms, canals, irrigation systems, new projects, and mosques. He was welcomed by all and praised for his work of freedom, justice, and equality, and Islam for his American black people. Mr. Muhammad visited and was received in Istanbul, Turkey, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, Cairo, Egypt, where he met with Egyptian President Nasser, Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, the holy city of Mecca in Arabia, the holy city of Medina in Arabia, Damascus, Syria, the cities of Khartoum and Undaman in the Sudan, where he spoke on Sudan National Radio, and Lahore, Pakistan. The messenger returned to America the latter part of January in 1960. This I mean from my heart. Yes, sir. Everywhere we go, respect people, and people will respect you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Don't think that you are so great now just because uh, God promised you the kingdom. Wait until you get in it. Yes, sir. As the 1960s unfolded, Messenger Muhammad assigned his son, Akbar Muhammad, who had been educated and graduated from the University of Islam and other Chicago universities to teach Arabic at the University of Islam in Temple No. 7 in New York City. Akbar had accompanied his father on the Messenger's historic world trip through parts of the Muslim world. Akbar's complete fluency in Arabic enabled him to serve as his father's interpreter. Later, Akbar was sent by his father to Cairo, Egypt for advanced studies at Al-Azhar University, the oldest university in the world, from which he graduated. In 1961, Messenger Muhammad's son, Minister Wallace D. Muhammad, was convicted and jailed for failure to register for the Selective Service, just as his father was in 1942, and as his brothers Emmanuel, who served in the same prison as his father, and Nathaniel, who was also jailed on the same unwarranted charges Remember that flag is still flying over America. Yes, sir. <laughs> Honor and respect the man. Yes, sir. <laughs> because he still have his flag. <laughs> that is what uh, that can be in a team between them and us in that way of respect. Yes, sir. We don't have to get out to try to make fun of them just because you have learned yourself. And now you have learned them. Yes, sir. That's right, Apostle. Just remember yes, sir. that they show you respect after you have Learn yourself. Yes, sir. Show them respect too. Yes, sir. Because when you didn't know yourself, you didn't respect yourself, nor anyone else. The black man of America begins the 60s with increased cries of integration by demonstrations, marches, 
More sit-ins. And yet facing more suffering by attacks of dogs, fire hoses, beatings, and death in his cry for justice. As the success of Mr. Muhammad and his followers increased, white America stepped up its attack against him and his followers. Newspapers and magazine articles began to appear, describing the divine teachings of Mr. Muhammad as hate teachings. In Chicago, a court ruled that we must sell to the city a five-acre tract of land that Mr. Muhammad had the Muslims to purchase to build a hospital at 85th and South Park, now known as King Drive. Instead, the city built a playground for black people to continue sporting and playing. In 1962, Illinois State Senator Gottschalk attempted to get the University of Islam school in Chicago closed, describing the religion of Islam as hate teachings. April 27, 1962, the savage and brutal Los Angeles Police Department, numbering nearly 100, came into our temple number 27 without warning, shooting and killing our secretary, Ronald T. X. Stokes. Another brother was paralyzed, having to spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair. Seven innocent people were shot. Mayor Yorty traveled to the White House to bring about a federal attack upon the Muslims. Police break into the Monroe, Louisiana temple upon unarmed Muslims, attempting to kill them and then falsely charge them with an attack upon the police. President Kennedy is killed in November of 1963. The first announcement falsely accused the Muslims of his death. Malcolm Shabazz, whom Mr. Muhammad taught, rejects Mr. Muhammad's advice not to endanger Muslims' lives by speaking on the death of the president. All other ministers of Muhammad's temples in more than 30 cities obeyed Messenger Muhammad's wise instructions. But Malcolm, proud and humiliated by suspension from speaking, breaks away from Islam to form his own nationalist group. World boxing champion Muhammad Ali, then known as Cassius Clay, announces to the world that he has returned to his religion of Islam. America, fearing the acceptance of other blacks to their own religion, decided to use Muhammad Ali as an example by stripping him of his championship in order to frighten blacks into thinking something may happen to them. Malcolm is killed by gunshots in his own group meeting. The temple in Harlem, New York, is firebombed by enemies. But Mr. Muhammad is determined that Islam will hold fast in New York and orders that the firebomb temple building be purchased and completely renovated into a modern new school and temple of Islam. National television announced that killers are coming to Chicago to seek the life of the messenger. But Islam removed all fear from Elijah Muhammad. He recalled the Psalm of David and relied on Almighty God Allah. The wrath of Allah began to show America was stooped into war in Vietnam. American schools and cities are engulfed in riots and burnings. America's white youth rebelled in revolt of their own white school systems. America's economy begins to disrupt. America's dollar begins to decline. American people begin to lose faith and disrespect in their own government and political leaders. America reverts back to the savage clothing style of the caveman days. Mr. Muhammad smiles, for he knows that in the Holy Quran, it is written that they plan a plan and Allah plans a plan. But know that Allah is the best of planners. America attempts to divide the black people of America against Elijah Muhammad and his Muslim followers. But instead, Allah causes the Vietnam War to divide them, as again some of our black brothers and sisters shed their black blood for the glory of America. Allah was indeed blessing the Honorable Elijah Muhammad with success in all the efforts he was making. Messenger Muhammad continued to speak out. On July 15, 1962, the Airy Crown Theater at McCormick Place was the place where Messenger Muhammad made known his entire program of what the Muslims want. It was indeed a highlight speech. Other memorable speeches include speeches made at Washington, D.C. in June of 1960. But they can't represent God. As you and me, do they will be given away the power to rule. They were not to rule under the teachings of reality of God. They were made 
Michigan, June 1962, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Flint, Michigan, in October of 1963, New York City again in June of 1964, Los Angeles, August 64, Detroit, Michigan, August 1965. The Nation of Islam purchased several homes for the Muslim followers in Chicago. The homes are in well-kept neighborhoods with cut lawns. Inside, there are modern kitchens, recreation rooms, and air conditioning. Mr. Muhammad continues to give more insight on his teachings and reaches more and more people by publishing two books entitled Message to the Black Man in America and How to Eat to Live, Volume 1. The University of Islam continues to develop superior students. By turning out students who can read and write at grade level or above, Muhammad's Universities of Islam are setting standards for education that are higher than those set by the accreditation boards of the public schools. Reverend Martin Luther King meets with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in February of 1966, and Reverend King agrees with Mr. Muhammad and the principles he is teaching of justice for the black man and the true meaning of the Bible. He was shot down by an assassin's bullet just before he could make public his acceptance of the messenger's teachings. After years of selling the literature of other black people in the form of magazines, newspapers, and books to be rejected by them, Mr. Muhammad decides to begin printing and publishing the Muhammad Speaks newspaper in 1961, the newspaper which immediately becomes one of the largest selling black journals and one of the largest selling newspapers, white or black, in America. The readership now exceeds 1,200,000 papers. The paper was first published in the basement of the school and later in the office building at 79th and Champlain Avenue. Always concerned with the basic necessities of life, Mr. Muhammad had the Nation of Islam purchase more than 2,000 acres of land in Georgia, more than 1,500 acres of land in Michigan, and more than 6,000 acres of land in Alabama. The Nation of Islam built a new building at 79th and Vernon, which now houses a modern bakery. The old Muhammad Speaks newspaper office at 79th and Champlain was torn down and a new building is built that houses a clothing department store and several medical and general offices on the top floor. At 26th and Federal Street, Mr. Muhammad takes an old building and converts it to a new modern newspaper printing plant, a cold storage and meat packing facility with warehouse and storage combination. A slaughtering house is purchased for the slaughtering of lambs. Fleets of trucks are purchased for the nationwide transport of newspapers and food. A modern Your Supermarket was opened in the latter part of 1960. 
A modern restaurant was actually designed by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad himself. The conversion of the then bank building into a beautiful Salam restaurant was completed at a cost exceeding one half million dollars. As the 60s began with blacks crying integration, blacks endured beatings, marches, sit-ins, humiliating demonstrations. The power and the message of truth from Almighty God Allah remained the same. The road to freedom, justice, and equality to acceptance of black self and determination to go for self, according to the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, was adopted in diluted proportions by every black religious, political, or social organization. They all changed their programs so that by the end of the 60s, blacks were desiring black power, black ownership, and black self-determination. In the 60s, efforts by whites in America to hinder the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad were stepped up. The defection of Malcolm X, the killing of the secretary at the Los Angeles Temple, the dethroning of Muhammad Ali, attempts to close the University of Islam in Chicago, the burning of the mosque in New York City, and continued attempts on the life of the messenger. But in all of these efforts, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad turned what looked like trouble into doubled success for the nation of Islam. And simultaneously, Allah caused America greater trouble and decline than had ever been experienced. The Vietnam War, the student rebellion, generation gaps, loss of respect and confidence in America's leaders, decline of the dollar, riots, and burnings in the cities. A modern office building was built at 78th and Cottage Grove, housing the Nation of Islam Information Center, Muhammad Import Store, the Nation of Islam Fish Import Office, and the Muslim Farm Office. The nation's clothing factory was enlarged and moved to 84th and Cottage Grove. Guarantee Bank and Trust Company, a losing business for more than 10 years, was purchased by the Nation of Islam and turned into a profitable business venture under the direction of Messenger Muhammad and its president, Mr. Oscar S. Williams. For the first time since his birth and his being missioned by the Savior, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was blessed to move into a newly built home never occupied by anyone before him. For years, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had built homes for others, given jobs to others, and now, for the first time in his life, he moved into a home built especially for him. After a marriage that endured for 55 years, the nation of Islam and people throughout the world mourned the death of our dearly beloved leader and teacher's wife, Sister Clara Muhammad, who passed away in the last half of 1972. The 70s saw a further decline in America's power. The messenger purchased additional farmland in the South. He also began the importing of goods to be sold at minimum cost to the black consumer. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad began the importing of fresh fish from the unpolluted waters of Peru to ports in America for low profit sale to America's black consumers. The Nation of Islam purchased a DC-7 prop plane for transporting goods from foreign shores. But this plane has been replaced by a modern jet aircraft, and more planes are on the way. More and better homes were purchased to house the Muslim believers at very low rentals. In 1972, Messenger Muhammad purchases and opens the largest house of worship and school that's operated and supported by blacks anywhere in America. The crescent above the temple is seen rotating east to west 24 hours a day. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, ever eager to spread the word of truth of living to our people, writes three additional books of wisdom. How to Eat to Live, Book Two, The Fall of America, and Our Savior Has Arrived. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad also built new single-family dwellings across from his newly built family home. In spite of his great works, opposition to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad continues to this very day. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad desires and has been seeking to build a hospital for the service to black people in their community. He sought to do this in conjunction with the establishment of a college campus and a complete medical facility on the property of the South Shore Country Club. Although the messenger was willing to pay $12 million to build this educational and medical facility, the city of Chicago ruled that the acreage of the South Shore Country Club should be used to build a playground and amusement center in the black South Chicago community. All over the city and country, 
whites moved to remove parks and playgrounds in order to provide medical and educational facilities for their community. In Chicago, they do the exact opposite for blacks because it's a plan of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to make the black man do for self. For more than 43 years, the work of Messenger Muhammad had been mocked, scorned, and held in suspicion by virtually every government and professional agency in the country. But as the remarkable progress unfolded, not only in Chicago, but in their very own home cities, right before the eyes of local officials, sentiments changed. In less than two years, 11 different mayors, three governors, and a host of state legislators and professional groups had rushed to proclaim days, weeks, and other official ceremonies marking the progressive leadership of the Messenger of Allah. I think that he understands better than anybody else in this country what it's going to take to make black people free. Mayor Richard Gordon Hatcher of Gary, Indiana said, as he proclaimed the week of December 13, 1974, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad Week. And Mayor Daly of Chicago said, whereas the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has exhibited strong leadership to provide quality education, to establish prosperous businesses, to organize recreational activities, and to develop good citizenship in the community, now therefore I, Richard J. Daly, Mayor of the City of Chicago, do hereby proclaim March 29, 1974, to be the Honorable Elijah Muhammad Day in Chicago. And Mayor Maynard Jackson of Atlanta, Georgia said, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is a native of Sandersville, Georgia, and continues to influence his home state through the works of Muslims throughout Georgia and in Atlanta. We are speaking with a few brothers from Muhammad's Temple Number no. 1, Detroit, Michigan. Please give us your name and tell us what Islam has done for you. First, we'll hear from Brother Lieutenant Fleming X. Muhammad, ever since 1956, on the first hearing of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I was living for Adam in a two-room apartment. The bathroom was down the hall. The front room was the bedroom and the front room. I stayed in the back bedroom with my wife, little boy, Brother Fleming Jr., and myself. All of us clustered in a two-room apartment. And now, since I have been following the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I have been blessed with a large, beautiful home, two in a room that can house all my children. Now that we have a nice, we all my together have blessed us with a nice granddaughter from Fleming Jr. Now she don't have to sleep in across this room. She can sleep in a bedroom to herself, like all the rest of my children. And not saying that since following the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I would have been gone a long time ago if it was not for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. My brother John it. when I first heard the teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I was living at 4602 Stockton, living on the welfare, running down there begging the white folks for something I could do for myself. And I didn't know I could do for myself till I heard the teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Since I heard the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I got up to do for myself. And like he said, you have good friends, plenty of money, nice homes, good cars, friendships, and all walks of life. And I got some of all of those things. Plus, I have a business of my own, J&R Bakery. So we thank our life for Honorable Elijah Muhammad. My name is Brother Fred X. I live at 829 Russell. I started uh, following the messages in 1963, which was 11 years ago. When I started following the messages, I was down and out. Hey, one suit job I was barely getting bound. But after following the messages, I'd like to name a few of the blessings which he has stored, which has been many. <coughs> he blessed me with a nice home, positive building, nice cars, and a very successful business. My name is Brother Jackson X. I am 37 years of age. I was, I'm from a large family. And later in years, I thank a lot for the Unrighteous Muhammad also for best me for a more, better, and beautiful home. Now we will hear from one of Messenger Muhammad's ministers. I'm Minister John Muhammad of Muhammad's Temple No. 26 in San Francisco. In New England, when I first became a Muslim in the nation of Islam, I lived in a one-room flat. But I did not give up because the Unrighteous Muhammad taught us that Almighty God Allah promised us money, 
good homes and friendships in all walks of life. I am not the only one Allah have blessed over the years. Allah have blessed many Muslims. And if you come and follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you too will be blessed. What Allah has done for others, he'll do for you. The good life awaits you in the nation of Islam. When I came in the nation of Islam, I had no job, no trade, no skill. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad inspired me to study, to go to school. I went to school for welding, I learned welding. I went for pipe welding, I learned pipe welding. I went into the Pipe Fitters Association. I got a journeyman's card quickly. I came out of the Pipe Fitters Association. I went into business for myself in ironworks. I developed in ironworks and I started to hire men. I trained over 50 men. I employed 20 last year. We did a job for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. We put the fence around his home. That fence is one of the best fence in the country. These men were not previously iron workers. I trained them myself, inspired by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. After the Honorable Elijah Muhammad met with Master W.D. Farad in the 1930s, only black Ethiopia and Liberia were under independent rule. The serpent, as it was written in scriptures, had deceived the entire world. The power of Muhammad's message took root in the head, power, and leadership of the black and white world. Soon, visitors from South America, the Caribbean, Africa, the Orient, Arabia, East and Far East began to observe the awakening of the black man in America by this great teaching. The visitors, students, and diplomats returned to their countries with new pride, dignity, and self-respect and the yearn for self-determination as Messenger Muhammad teaches. Only Ethiopia represented black Africa in the white-dominated League of Nations. Ethiopia and Liberia were admitted during the founding of the United Nations in 1945. Now almost all of Africa, Arabia, the Far East, and Latin America, formerly under white control, colonial empires, or white-dominated, are now in the UN. The power of Messenger Muhammad's teachings is universal it's not limited or confined by borders. All peoples of the earth are affected by the power of Messenger Muhammad's message. Mr. Muhammad has visited many parts of the Muslim world and has sent several delegations to visit Latin America, the Caribbean, Africa, Arabia, the Far East, and the Orient. They are always well received, for Islam creates friendship in all walks of life. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad continues his work today he does not tire of this divine mission. His is a struggle to lead all of our black people to freedom, justice, and equality under Islam. Not a few or a handful of people. His concern is for the continuing misery of the black man in America. He wants an end to police brutality and attack. He wants freedom for all blacks under death sentences in the North and in the South. Freedom for all believers of Islam held in federal prisons. He does not believe so many thousands of black people should have to subsist on relief, charity, or live in poor housing. He wants all black children taught and trained by their own teachers. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad loves the black man of America and wants all to receive and enjoy freedom, justice, and equality with money, good homes, and friendship as he has shown all of us who have accepted Islam in North America. First. Islam is not a religion restricting women. Rather, Islam gives to the black women in America respect. For the first time, she has a choice of right, something she has never had before. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad has done more for the black woman in America than any man. Whereas before things were done to us and against us, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in the Muslim Girl Training and General Civilization class has provided for the black woman her place her rightful place in the home with her husband and children. As numbers have a greater or lesser value being in their place, the black women in America now have a greater value by being in the MGT and GCC. I know I am in the Muslim girl training and general civilization class, and I am, along with my sisters, respected and protected as the women of other nationalities are respected and protected. No man in history, either political, social, or religious, has had his family with him as Messenger Muhammad. His grandmother, Peggy Omar, his father, Mother Marie, brothers, sisters, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, nieces, 
nephews, and cousins, all have joined with him in accepting Allah as their God, Islam as their religion, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as the Messenger of Allah. His brothers, John, Johnny, and John are ministers. His sons, Wallace, Emmanuel, and Nathaniel are ministers. His daughters, Ethel Sharif and Lottie Muhammad, have both served as captains of the MGT and GCC. Lottie Muhammad serves as Dean of Girls at Muhammad's University of Islam in Chicago. Even in earlier times as now, both daughters served in many capacities, such as dishwashers, cooks, bakers, waitresses, or seamstresses. His daughter Ethel would be assigned to duty, rather the honor, of watching the Savior's car from her window when the Savior visited their home in Detroit. His son Herbert continues to assist and aid the messenger in the start of most publications since 1950, including the world-renowned Muhammad Speaks newspaper. His son, Brother Elijah Muhammad Jr., serves as Assistant Supreme Captain of the Nation of Islam. A nephew, Captain Roscoe Muhammad, serves as Captain at Muhammad's Temple No. 1 in Detroit, Michigan. A nephew, Brother Wali Muhammad, serves as Minister in Columbus, Ohio. A grandson, Sultan Muhammad, serves as Aviation Captain for the Jet Aircraft of the Nation of Islam. The list could go on and on and on, all serving. The family of Muhammad serves the Nation of Islam in all capacities. No other family can make that statement in any other nation. Here is the family tree and chart of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Here is a group picture of Messenger Muhammad's family in Detroit, and they too are his followers. Here is Brother Minister John Muhammad, Sister Emma Muhammad, and Brother Minister Johnny, the Messenger's brothers and sister. The Messenger's brother, Minister John Muhammad, with his sons and daughter. The Messenger's brother, Minister Johnny Muhammad, and wife, Sister Ethel Muhammad. The Messenger's nephew, niece, and family. Brother George Bogans, the son of Sister Tommy Bogans, the Messenger's deceased sister. The Messenger's nephew, Brother Captain Roscoe, his wife and daughter, with Sister Emma Muhammad, the sister of the Messenger and Captain Muhammad's mother. The roots of Messenger Muhammad are well established, growing deep and spreading, and are well nourished and cultivated by Almighty God Allah. This is not the end of Messenger Muhammad's work, or this truth you've just seen. No, it's only the beginning. For Messenger Muhammad continues to work on and on for the salvation of the American so-called Negro. Assalamu alaikum, which means peace be unto you in the Arabic language. heavy-hearted because of the absence of our leader, the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. We offer these words of encouragement to his followers everywhere. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that we have five senses, but that no one sense can satisfy all the needs of the body. We should use all the senses working together. Now is the time. The body must use all the senses and stay together. The messenger spent all his life in efforts to better the condition of the black man. We should try and see that we keep his principles and ideals in us. The absence of the messenger's presence is a loss. He worked for the unity of the black man. It is a greater loss to lose his principles. The Holy Quran teaches us that we should not refer to the righteous as being dead. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad has returned to Allah. 
he lives on in his works, and more important, he lives on in us. His leadership remains. As Messenger Muhammad's family has been and are with him in all his wise divine decisions, we the Muslims join with them in uniting behind the leadership of Minister Wallace D. Muhammad, designated by Master Farad Muhammad and Messenger Elijah Muhammad in the continuation of this great divine leadership. Thank <laughs> you.